Hello and welcome to another Royal Society publishing video podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr Mark Leake from the University of Oxford to talk about single molecule cellular biophysics, the topic of a recent theme issue published in Phil Trans B, which Mark kindly guest edited for us. Mark, can you tell us about the main aim of this theme issue? So, so our general aim here is really to, to highlight the developments in single molecule biophysics uh, that have happened uh, over the past 10 years. Um, and this has essentially evolved into a, a new field in its own right called single molecule cellular biophysics. And um, really to explain what I mean by that, we have to understand what we mean by biophysics. Uh, and this really is the application of um, either physical methods or techniques or even intellectual concepts uh, applied to addressing some of the challenging questions in the life sciences. And, and possibly the best known example of this is the structural determination of DNA. So um, you had to use bulk biochemical techniques to purify the DNA to form uh, crystals of the DNA. But to actually get the, the structure of DNA out, uh, you had to basically um, perform X-ray diffraction. And this is fundamentally a physical science technique and also analyze these X-ray diffraction patterns. And so this is you know, heavily embedded in, in the physical sciences. Now, single molecule biophysics takes this to a, a completely different length scale. And it's a length scale characterized by the nanometer. And by that, I mean um, a meter divided by uh, a thousand million. And this is the length scale of, of, of single molecules. Now, cellular biophysics um, really involves the, the application of single molecule um, biophysics techniques, um, but applied to either live cell systems or to experiments which are um, highly physiologically relevant. So they may be test tube level assays, but the number of components involved in that test tube level assay is so high that it becomes far more physiologically relevant than early day in vitro level single molecule biophysics assays. Why is this field so important and how is it helping scientists answer some of the fundamental questions in cellular biology? Okay. This begs the question of what drives cellular processes. Uh, and, and really we, we know now that the driving factors in um, cell processes are things called molecular machines. Uh, and these are machines um, like um, macroscopic length scale machines such as you know cars and um, you know other other devices um, but these are characterized by the length scale of the single molecule now the difference between these machines and macroscopic length scale machines is that there's um, a characteristic instability in these machines and by that I mean they can flip between different energy states and this is all part of the, the required function in cell biology. Now using bulk ensemble averaging techniques which is sort of the classical biochemical approach we can't address that level of instability because what you then focus on is the, the um, average um, of many different energetic states if you like. You can't see the whole heterogeneous picture but really the cellular process is actually governed by this fundamental heterogeneity. So you have to have a technique that can fundamentally allow you to identify these different key metastable states. Uh, and this is the regime of, of single molecule techniques. And this is why it's so essential to actually use these techniques to understand cell biology. Since the first detection of single molecules, what do you think have been the key developments that have led to the field we see today? I, th I think there have been two key developments. <clears throat> One is um, an exponential rise in the sensitivity of detectors, um, primarily driven by camera technology. So cameras are so sensitive now that you can detect 95% of the photons incident upon that detector. So 19 after 20 um, photons are detected. This is a tremendous uh, increase in sensitivity compared to you know, 10, 20 years ago. And this really does allow us to get down to uh, detecting single molecules when um, the technique involves something like fluorescence um, detection. Secondly, there have been enormous developments in genetics. Now, um, these are key because some of the techniques demand um, the genetic manipulation um, and establishment of cell strains 
uh, that can express things called fluorescent proteins. Now, fluorescent proteins are natural dye molecules, but they are embedded in the genetic code of that organism. Um, and it really does uh, allow us to see um, single uh, protein molecules uh, with these fluorescent proteins. Um, and so being able to basically manipulate the DNA of these fluorescent proteins and um, artificially fuse them with the DNA of a foreign organism uh, has led to enormous in improvement in, in single molecule uh, detection and imaging techniques. Can you briefly tell us about some of the latest techniques that scientists are using to study single molecules? Broadly speaking, we can, we can divide these techniques, one, into positional um, determination techniques, and two, into techniques which allow us to um, either manipulate single molecules or measure their forces. Okay. So with the latter, um, we have techniques such as optical or laser tweezers, atomic force, microscopy, force spectroscopy. Uh, with the former, with um, being able to determine where these single molecules are, we have um, techniques such as fluorescence imaging, super resolution imaging, um, turf imaging. Um, and the exciting things that are happening now really involve the combination of these, these two methodologies. So a combination of several techniques is used in order to generate the best data. Exactly, because the, the first generation of single molecule techniques basically involved um, isolated single molecules using one technique. Um, now we can actually focus on molecules which are not necessarily isolated, but also throw a combination of different single molecule techniques at that one single molecule. Uh, and what that generates is um, extra dimensions of information and that all allows us to build up a picture of biologically really what's happening. And how are biocomputational methods contributing to the field? So, so there, are, there are two key challenges with um, experimental single molecule data. One is that there's a lot of it and two is that it's um, the signals are basically at the level of the background noise of the system. Uh, which means it's very difficult to uh, detect these events, but also the events can be dominated by so-called stochastic features. By that I mean essentially random features. And this means it's very difficult to tell from any one single molecule event exactly what's happening. So if you remember, I told you about multiple states existing with molecular machines. Um, if you have um, multiple states, then that means that the single molecule measurement that you get out will have a different number to it, but that number is plus or minus a, a noise factor. And because we're working so close to the level of the noise, you have to have some robust objective computational method to allow us to probabilistically extract exactly what state that single molecule is in. And also um, computation allows us to automate the whole process, um, which you know one helps with objectifying the results, but too because there's so much data there, it speeds up the whole process enormously. So is it a case of experimental data being plugged into a computational algorithm that will take us to the final set of results? In, in part you're correct, um, but the truth is it's more of a dialectical process. So we'll have an experimental run, we'll um, then run these data through the, the computational algorithms and then look at the results and that will feed back into the future experiments that we need to do. Uh, and if we can do that fast enough, we can do that in real time. Um, and so it's a kind of, you end up with a, a sort of convergent experiment where the, the algorithm changes itself in light of the, the results from the experimental data. Are there specific benefits of using live cells over fixed tissue samples? So um, naively, one might say that um, using an in vitro, a dead cell approach, if you like, um, is bound to be better uh, because it's less contaminated with um, noise, with heterogeneity from, um, you know, a population of cells. And, you know, because th this uh, detection challenge at the single molecule level is significant. But um, the, the truth is that, that cells aren't, aren't test tubes. Um, a test tube assay is a very much reduced version of, of your cell. Uh, in the cell you have essentially um, distinct, discrete 
localizations both in time and in space. So processes will only occur in a certain part of the cell or at a certain time in the cell cycle. And these factors are difficult to replicate in a test tube. So there are compelling reasons to want to try to do live cell assays. But that being said, that's not to say that you know, live cell good, dead cell bad. If you're clever about how you do in vitro or test tube level assays, you can actually have a, um, a very complementary assay to the live cell techniques. You just have to be careful uh, to make sure that the physiological relevance is, is high, so that you're not just dealing with isolated single molecules, but you have um, a whole uh, makeup of um, biochemicals in the system which are relevant to that biological process. Ultimately, um, whenever you do an experiment, whether it's in vitro or in vivo, you're only getting a snapshot of the picture. You know, you, you have, say for example, fluorescent tags on a few key protein molecules, which you hope will inform you um, as to what is happening in that cell process. What you don't see is the rest, and the rest is significant, it's, you know, it's dark matter, biologically, um, and, and that's, that represents a challenge. And the complementary aspect between in vitro and in vivo is such that you can essentially label different components to build up a, a bigger picture of the, this jigsaw as to what really is happening inside the living cell. And finally, what does the future offer for single molecule cellular biophysics? I, I would say that the future lies beyond the single molecule and um, beyond the single cell. So uh, by that I mean um, techniques are being developed which allow us to monitor not just one um, protein molecule in a cell at the same time, but um, a whole raft of, of different proteins that may be interacting with each other. So although these are single molecule techniques, this is multi-molecule detection. Um, secondly, um, most of the techniques at the moment are focused on single cells. Uh, a, a logical evolution of that uh, would be to look at the multicellular level, so communication between different cells, ultimately going on to, to whole tissues, because these are the questions we really want to address, questions which are, are biomedically more relevant. You know, why do, why do cancers form in the way they do? Um, why do uh, tissues in a human body not regenerate as well as they can when people get old? Um, and so these are all questions which we can think about addressing with single molecule techniques, but we really have to push back the boundaries of the techniques to allow us to go to a multicellular, multi-molecule environment. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for watching.